Hi, I'm Shana. And I'm Tracy, and we are the creators of The Pump and Dump Show. We are moms, but we were women first. And in this podcast, we explore what it's like to be a woman who also happens to be a mom. What up, breeders? Hello, breeders. Welcome back to the Pump and Dump Podcast. Episode 13. Lucky number 13. Yep. So we have a topic that I think is near and dear to everyone's hearts. It's not particularly fun or funny to discuss, but we'll try, we'll try to keep it lighthearted. <laughs> um, but we wanted to dive into the changes that happen in your marriage or partnership after a baby shows up, how your relationship changes. You know, for many of us, it doesn't always change for the better. And um, and how you change as a person, how your mindset changes and how you approach your marriage and your partner while you're also trying to now be a mom. We have a really special guest coming to discuss it more professionally than we can. Because she's a professional. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we we put a poll out on our Facebook group, which if you're not a part of our Band of Mothers Facebook group, it has been a real blast. Um, and it's hashtag Band of Mothers on Facebook. And we put a poll out and asked our moms, you know, what were the changes? What were the things that happened in your marriage, mostly negative, that occurred? And the results are fascinating and sad and to uh, and very validating because I think we all realize that we're kind of feeling the same thing. So we're going to get into those results in a little bit with our guests. Here's the thing. I think that no matter how great your partner is, um, no matter how successful your marriage feels before and after you have babies, there are just some truths um, to being a mom versus a dad, especially with newborns. Mm -hmm. And so, um, personally I felt, um, very connected to my motherfucker when, oh, and if you are new to the pump and dump <laughs> show, we call dads motherfuckers because they fuck mothers. proper use of the term. There yes. you go. So my motherfucker and I, I, I felt, you know, like, like literally so much love for him pushing out his baby, you know, it was, mm -hmm. it was a very beautiful thing. And then, um, to within the same week feel like the, the, equal, um, equally passionate amount of hatred <laughs> at the same time, I feel like is just so real because yeah. there's just, there's things that we hear as moms that they don't hear. There's things that we feel physically sure. as moms that they don't, um, and the hormones that are going on in mm -hmm. your body, you, at least I couldn't help, um, feel like, gosh, this is just happening to me and not him. Yeah. And it was, yeah, it feels, I mean, we always talk about how motherhood feels very isolating. And I think I just felt like I couldn't express what was going on inside of me. I didn't understand the hormone surge and the way my body was, well, deflating from preeclampsia, but also just, just shifting into not being pregnant anymore and having a birth. And I couldn't, I couldn't enunciate the irritation that I felt. <laughs> so you were just too tired. <laughs> well, I was too tired, but I was too, um, it was too much. Like it was like a, it's like I became a different person over a course of just a few days because you have to. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to, it's hard to put that into words and like convey that to your partner. Especially when you just, I think what you said, you just instinctively, you just instinctively do more. Then you do. I, you, I think I literally think you hear things differently. Absolutely. You, you uh, I, well, a baby cries and you start to leak yeah. milk. I mean, that doesn't happen to men. That's what we used to joke about. If people were to bring babies to the pump and dump show, like <laughs> we can't do it because like one baby would cry. It ruin and it would, everybody's, everybody's, <laughs> everybody's shirt would just be soaked. It's so true. It would ruin everyone's night. <laughs> not, not because we hate babies, but it's no, just it's, moms just can't. Yeah. Moms you just can't, can't physically deal. So, you know, no matter the the health of your, obviously it, it does matter if you had an unhealthy relationship going in. I'm not sure that babies are going to fix anything, which is something we joke about mm -hmm. in, in one of our songs too, um, that your marriage will get stronger because it's like such a joke. <laughs> I think that's so funny. <clears throat> what? I just think it's funny looking back on it that that's always something, you know, you, you hear, 
well, we wanted to have children because we thought it would be the best thing for our marriage. But I don't actually know anyone that <laughs> that pursued that route, you know? Oh, you I mean just think it's like kind of out it there. To fix a marriage? Yeah, I feel like it's this cliche that we hear, but do you know anyone that <laughs> actually got pregnant just to fix their broken marriage? It seems like a, te- you know, it seems terrible like a terrible idea. idea. But, to, but it's funny that we joke about it and everybody laughs about it as like this very true thing. But, you know, in many ways, your marriage is so much stronger because you are bonded by these children, right? So, like, absolutely that is true in many healthy relationships but it's so easy to laugh at because you know that your struggles just went from you know three because the marriage is difficult right so you're like struggling at three to like 17 <laughs> i was gonna say 600 but sure, sure 17 sure. 17 600 it's all the same um so quickly and so dealing with that um and finding um a way to deal with that resentment is something that um Mary angela is going to help us with um something I've been thinking about. This is what I was trying to remember. There is an intimacy that you have with a baby or your child Mm -hmm. or your children um, that, and I've always said this since I had babies because I I just, it it just was so clear to me that you have never felt before Mm -hmm. unless it was with a lover. It's, it's not a sexual intimacy, obviously with your babies or your children, but that intimacy is, um, it's totally, you don't know it until you have right. the babies. And it fills a very large space in your life as, as a woman and as a mom. That you probably weren't prepared to have filled so quickly. I think you hear, it's the same thing. It's like you hear, oh, you'll never know the love. You'll never know. You'll never understand. And then it happens to you. And it's like you get hit by a freight train. And, and with, it's very hard to process. And it replaces a lot of the intimacy that you yes. needed and craved from your partner. And I think... That that is something I want to talk to Angela about because I feel like that is felt very deeply by the motherfuckers. Yeah. And and it is it is not something you can really explain. Hey, look, I'm getting my intimacy needs filled by my yeah, I'm baby. Good. I'm good over here. Yeah. You, you go do whichever you want to do. <laughs> because I get that they, they may be, and maybe they feel, I mean. Well, that's what I wonder because I feel like, I agree, you 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 have this seismic shift inside you. But then what happens to the motherfuckers? I mean, they are sort of, I feel like on some level, they're sort of left out to dry to process their own seismic shift that happens. I mean, gosh, my husband was the first one to hold our baby. I mean, I didn't, I had a C-section. I didn't even know who, I didn't even know what the sex was. He, he was the first one to have contact with her. And, and, you know, men aren't allowed to express their side of like, how deep and and transformative that is because the good ones are dealing with the mess of their wives <laughs> you know and they're and they and I think they realize that their place is very different and that must be really frustrating too because I feel like I'm sure at some point my husband probably just wanted to curl up in the fetal position and just weep for joy and pain and anguish and confusion and all of those things but if I had seen him doing that he would have slept in the garage, you know? I would have been like, what Get the up. hell are you doing? <laughs> do you have any idea? You know? He's not right. allowed to do that. Right. Because, it, well, and essentially and truthfully, it's always worse for us at the beginning. Well, so, sure. So nobody wants to see that. <laughs> no. No. I remember, so with my second, you know, we just were so tired because our baby was Ooh. a year and a half when we had the second baby. And so he was so tired because he still had to take care of this other baby mm. and he really bonded with I her, remember which was that. very yeah. cool. But then, like, all I wanted, all I wanted was that last feed of the night, which I know it's late, but I got a breastfeed, and honey, can you just make it through one episode of Jeopardy with me? Let's sit here. Let's watch Jeopardy so that you're, I just want you awake next to me because every oh. other feed, every other breastfeeding session is solo. He is solo. And I just was like, okay, this is like, I don't remember. Yeah, it's hard to remember now what was like the 10 PM or something. And it would just be like, all right, I'm turning on Jeopardy so we can both be like active and I swear to God like three questions in there's just snoring next Mm -hmm. to me and I could not have hated him more Mm -hmm. I hated him so much in that moment and just just you could have just it's a half hour show it's Mm -hmm. a half hour show and I just needed you to stay awake I don't know why I needed that but I just you feel so isolated you feel like I'm the only one feeding this baby all the time and I get that we're both so tired but I'm the one who has to get up in three hours and do it again I remember when he would come home feeling the same amount of hate if he even like 
glanced at his phone or spent too long in the bathroom or <laughs> took too long to change out of his work clothes. Cause I'm like, you are home now. You are doing this with me. Yes. I, you know, you don't get it. You don't get it. You don't get diversions anymore. You had your work, you had your drive home in peace. And I just remember being like, so and do you remember in those early days? I mean, if he was for me, if he was four minutes late from coming home from work, I was livid. And I look back on it now and I realize a lot of that was fear. And a lot of that was some postpartum crap that I was dealing with yeah. for sure. Um, but the, the poor guy, I mean, walks in and doesn't know what he's walking into. And it's just anything he does that isn't as hyper-focused as I have been <laughs> for the last 36 hours straight, essentially. Yeah. is He's just doomed. But I'm, I'm still, still bitter. I'm still like that where I'm just like, God, I mean, you know, we work all day. I'm the one who picks up the kids. I make dinner. Uh, that's not always true. He helps a lot with dinner. I said that because that seemed like a universal mom thing to say. Uh, you're doing, sorry. you're making, a, making lot a lot more, more dinner. Dinners. Maybe that's why I'm feeling this you're, so strongly. Yeah, right you are. You know, but I'm the one who remembers what days the kids oh. take baths. I'm the one who schedules everything. I pay all the bills. No, I know that's not true for a lot of families, but you know, it's like they're in the bath and I'm just like, if he does not volunteer to wash the children right now, I am going to lose my mind. Mm -hmm. And it's still happening because the truth is they're fine just being in a sudsy bath and getting out, you know, mm -hmm. and when I'm out of town and I say the kids need baths, you know, I remind him it gets done mm -hmm. and they're perfectly healthy and happy. It's just not the way we want it done. No, And it, I'm so mad about it. And it's so silly. Yeah. Well, you know, and that's the thing. I mean, that's the one thing I really realized and it took a while after having a baby is that, and this is sort of cliche and we've all seen memes around it, but the amount of brain, <sighs> usage that a mom has going every single minute of the, of the day like the is multitasking yeah, just all of it. It's you're right. I mean, it is the bills, it's the groceries, it's the, you know, and then you have it's, it's presence and it's planning and it's camps and it's doctor's visits and it's medicine and it's vitamins and it's clean bathrooms and it's W bottle washing and breastfeeding and learning about diseases and worrying <laughs> about screen time. It's everything. And then on top of it, it's, am I working out? And am I having enough sex? And am I walking the dog? Because I forgot that I had dogs. And, you know, am I keeping the house clean? And all of these things, if you don't have help, if you don't have a nanny or you know, our participating husband, our participating husband, it is unbelievably overwhelming. It's almost soul crushing. And it's, it's, I think it's a natural state for most women. I mean, we just take on more, but it is, I mean, how, how could it not fuck you up <laughs> at some point, you know, your relationship, your relationship to anyone, but yes, and you're obviously going to take it all out on the person that you're most intimate with, like you said. Well, and the person who doesn't have the instincts to take that on and it's not even <laughs> and we'll have to ask our guest about this too I don't even know if you know if it's something that's if it's a realistic expectation or if it's just accepting <laughs> like is it that we as moms just have to accept the truth which is that we take more on we have more physical connection hormonally and physically to the to the children and how can we lower our expectations from our partner to, to keep a healthy marriage? Basically, we're just the stronger sex. And well, how do we reconcile that? <laughs> that's absolutely true. But we're talking about marriage and we're talking about uh, marriages that seem to crumble um, once babies come in the picture. So yeah. thank you for listening. We got a special guest. Special, special guest. guest. So our special guest today is Angela Sassyville. She is a relationship expert and founder of Flourish Counseling and Coaching here in Denver, Colorado, where we do this podcast mm -hmm. and where Tracy and I live. Um, and she's here to discuss with us marriage after babies. Mm. Welcome, Angela. Thank you for having me. Angela, you're me. also a mom too, so I yeah, I've seen it on both sides of the coin. Yep, and I've survived 19 years of marriage and counting. Oh. Wow. Well, that's positive. That's great. Yeah. I'm going to start saying that. <laughs> and counting. Yeah. And counting. <laughs> yeah. I like it. I love that. Tracy and I have talked so much about the universality. Is that a word? Did I just mess that up? No, I think that's a thing. 
I'm not sure, but let's we're go with it. We're going to go with it. Yep. Of stress on a marriage once you have newborns, tiny babies in the house. Um, mm-hmm. Obviously, this can depend a lot on what your marriage was like before the babies. Um, but people come to you to help with that issue. So um, what is the most common um, issue that you that you deal with with couples right after they've had a baby? Well, I would say when couples have really little kids, you know, infants and preschoolers, the most common thing that we hear is there's a lot of resentment around the mm-hmm. house and a lot of frustration um, that there's so much to be done um, and uh, people don't always feel supported by their partner in that new parenthood role. Um, and we've all been there, right? Yeah. It's pretty life-changing. The very first night that my husband and I brought our first daughter back home from the hospital, um, she screamed and cried the whole freaking night. <laughs> and he and I kind of looked at each other in terror with this like look of, oh my God, what did we just what do we to do? our yeah. lives? What have we done? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And we know from the research on relationships that marital satisfaction usually takes a sharp nosedive, usually after the birth of the first baby. Interesting. Marital satisfaction. Mm-hmm. Huh. Like if you were to ask the husband and the wife or the wife and the wife or I guess whatever. Usually both partners are yeah. struggling with it. Right. Sure. And mm-hmm. both people just, if you ask them if they're happy with their marriage in those, in the throats of those early years, they'll just say no. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Well, that's, um, so we did this poll on our Facebook group and, uh, that's kind of the sentiments we got. The number one, um, the most popular feeling after having babies was feeling overwhelmed with very little help. Um, and then the second one, second one was resentment towards my partner. Mm-hmm. And I wonder I'm very curious about, I mean, Shay and I were just talking about this, about the shift that happens in your brain when you become a mom in the physical sense that the baby is here, not when you're caring. Yeah. Something happens to you. I mean, physiologically, let alone spiritually and all the other things. I felt like I just became a different person. I mean, there was parts of my, the inside of my brain and my heart that were ignited that I didn't know were there. And a lot of them were very good parts and joyful and happy. And a lot of them were very bitter and angry and terrified and snappy and judgmental. <laughs> and I'm sorry, common? Tracy. We, we can't relate to you at all. <laughs> all right. Well, I'll check myself in with you then later. <laughs> yeah, you need to call Angela. Yeah, okay. Well, yeah. So a lot of what happens to us is, first of all, it starts out oftentimes like, not always, but oftentimes blissful and exciting, right? So some of the beauty that's going on is we know it's super bonding for couples to do things where they have a shared meaning behind it. Mm. So if when we were single and footloose and fancy free, we always said we wanted to have a family one day and then we do that thing, that is beautifully, powerfully Mm. bonding, right? Yeah, sure. Um, It's also really strengthening when we have... um, other life dreams that we're pursuing. So maybe a piece of that is we said we wanted to become homeowners and now we're getting ready for family planning and we're doing that. Also really connecting for couples. But then you kind of get over that hump of the baby is here and some of the bliss starts to wear off. Mm -hmm. And I think in particularly for women in our generation, we take a lot of pride being independent, Mm. strong, self-reliant. That is our comfort zone. Mm. We all have a bit of superwoman inside of us Mm -hmm. and we like her. (laughs) Right? We Mm -hmm. do. Yeah. We do like her. That's so funny because when I had my first baby, I would say that to myself in the shower to keep going. Mm. I would say, I am a superwoman. (gasps) I am a superwoman. When I thought I was going to die every morning, Aww, like right. I would just finally, like the baby would be in the sink, like, in sure. the, cause this was safe to put your baby <laughs> I mean, in, all did. In, a, in a, what was it? The car seat, but in yep. the sink she next to the shower, it's all she good. was buckled in. And I would just say that to myself, like that was what kept me going. So yeah. anyway, mm-hmm. so then here's what happened. Superwoman gets kind of bitchy at her partner. Right. Mm -hmm. So that whole stereotypical notion of being a quote unquote nag comes from the fact that we can be super resentful, super frustrated, 
And we can take that strong, independent part of ourselves. And sometimes we kind of unleash holy hell onto our partners. Mm. Yes. Yes, we do. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Um, I've written a whole book about this and how it manifests in my marriage. Oh, yeah. Okay. I mean, it was... It was it was pretty fugly in my marriage when the really? kids were tiny. Okay. Absolutely. And so this the second part to that is inside each, each of us, there's a second voice. And we don't always do a go- good job listening to her. That second voice is vulnerable. Mm. She has limits. Sometimes if she's been up all night with the baby and she's freaking exhausted, she cannot get through the next day without melting down. Mm. But what I did as a young mom and what so many of us do is we shame that part of ourselves. We don't like her. Mm. I used to think that, you know, if I asked my husband for more support, it would make me, quote unquote, needy. Mm. That's how uncool I thought it was. Interesting. And so I did what a lot of women do is I would push that vulnerable part Mm -hmm. of me that was feeling like overwhelmed and alone, and sometimes suffocated by motherhood, I would push her down and try to pretend that she wasn't there. And then as my frustration and exhaustion built, I would unleash holy hell against my (laughs) husband, honestly, in an angry way. And I can laugh about it now, but of course it wasn't. It wasn't quite so funny back then. He liked to call me Dr. Jekyll and Mrs. Hyde for a Mm, while. Because he would get this, you know, these totally different mixed messages from me. But, you know, when you say that that number one struggle, right, is the amount that we take on, it's so interesting because we talked about this in a podcast recently about this, you know, it's just a disconnect in the amount of guilt that we feel in our responsibilities Mm -hmm. where, um, you know, a, a dad just, it's just not, they're not wired exactly the same as we are when it comes to taking things on or feeling like we need to take care of it or we need to take care of everything. It's like totally. the other morning, Tracy and I were laughing because my husband is, it lets me sleep in on the weekends. By the way, that has saved our marriage. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. But I like woke up and when I woke up, he was walking in the door because he had gone to a yoga class. <laughs> And, like, a mom would, like, and my kids were here, by the way. My children were just, like, watching their tablets in their bedrooms because he had had a little talk and been, like, don't wake mom. But I'm going to go. I'm going to go. My kids are six and eight, so don't do this with, like, your (laughs) two-year-old. Right. But um, I was, like, gosh, a mom would never Never. allow herself Mm -hmm. to just walk out the door. To just walk out the door. But it's he was just, like, oh, this is perfect. No guilt here. Like, you know, asking for the things that you want, Mm -hmm. you know, giving yourself permission to ask for help is a struggle that I think we will always face no matter the age of your kids. Yes. Yes. And here's the interesting news. So not all relationship issues fall along gender lines, but more often than not, it's the man that is ready to leave the nest after the birth of the babies before the woman is, right? And is ready to start investing more time going back out there and having more of a life outside of the family. And oftentimes being um, playful and being physically active are some really positive attributes that men bring to our lives. And as their female partners, we sometimes resist those things, right? Like we don't always embrace them and and recognize how they help balance out our mom guilt and our super momness. You You mean the physical, like getting outside of the home ourselves? Like they're like you mean? Like they're like they're like oh yeah, so I'm cool. I'm just gonna start up with my basketball team again on Wednesday nights when even though you're still home with the kid, um, but I'm I'm good. I'm just gonna go do that. When I spent Mm -hmm. like the entire half an hour, I was at a book club being like, oh god, I gotta get home. He's crying. The baby's crying. Yeah, you know, like totally. That's the difference. Yeah. So is resentment then that this resentment that you're talking about the superwoman versus uh, the your reliant side that yeah. actually needs the your partner's help. The vulnerable woman. That's very, so that's very, that's on us. That's our female side. Is mm-hmm. there, is, is that what you find the most common reason for resentment? Or do you find that it's also common that the dudes just don't step up once the baby is born? 
I guess what I'm saying is, is there a deficiency in male partners and husbands that just drives women to drink essentially? And, and you just feel like, <laughs> wow, I thought you were going to be this dad that was going to help and you're just not doing freaking anything. Or is it that we're projecting onto them that they're not doing what we want them to do in our heads that we never inform them about. Um, <laughs> The, and, and also that they'll never be able to meet our standards with. Which one is it? Or mm -hmm. is it both? Mm -hmm. So I think there's a couple things going on. So the first thing that we can have ownership over is anytime you go after your partner, exuding negative vibes out of your body, resentment, anger, frustration, you should expect that they're going to back up away from you by at least six feet. And it's yes. probably going to create a little more distance and disconnection mm -hmm. in the relationship, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a better way to get your needs met, which is like, let him see you have an effing breakdown. Let mm -hmm. him see your cracks. Let him see you crying in the shower because the baby was up all night and you just don't know how you can do it. And ask for what you need. Make a request instead of filing a complaint about what you didn't get. Mm. That's a very different approach. Sh right? Showing him my cracks is what got me in this this uh, situation to begin with. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, that is that is a different approach than I think a majority of us. Because when you're angry, that mm -hmm. just exacerbates well, the. I mean, we know defense. that with our kids, it doesn't help when you yell at your kids. You know, they, <laughs> right. they don't do they shit. They just cower yeah. in the corner, and here so, they are. And are you saying that if we? take that measured approach in communication, do you generally find that the man will respond positively? Yes and no. Okay. So <laughs> that's your best tactic is be soft, be vulnerable, ask for what you need instead of complaining about what you're not getting. Mm -hmm. But here's the male side of things. And I adore all of the men that I get to work with. The expectations that we have for our male partners are... 200% of what our moms expected of our fathers for those of us who grew up with both parents hanging around, right? Mm -hmm. What is expected of men in this generation is so much more involvement and engagement with their kids and the child rearing process, um, more emotional availability. I mean, I'm a child of the 70s. Uh, my mom worked outside of the home, did 98% of the parenting, and all of the household management, right? Like we joked, Dad, do you even know where we keep the vacuum? Pop quiz, right. where's the vacuum? Right. Because that's how uninvolved men of his generation are, right? Mm hmm. So now we know so much more about our emotional needs than I think our parents' generation did sure. 30 years ago. But what that manifests as is what we expect of our husbands is radically more than what they saw role model right. so in no their own families point growing of reference. up. Exactly. We have this script in our heads, and maybe he's never seen that script. Maybe he has no idea how it goes. And of course, it can be every bit as overwhelming for any man to be adjusting to parenthood sure. as it is for a woman. They're just not often as good at letting us know that. Interesting. Yeah, that's what I was, we were also talking about. I always wonder what it must feel like to be a new dad because they're mm -hmm. not allowed to discuss, they're not allowed to weep openly and, you know, mm -hmm. gird their loins and, and feel this roller coaster of emotions of what just happened to them. Yeah. And I feel sad a little bit because they don't get the physical connection. They don't get to know well, this thing. And that's what we were speaking about in our introduction is the intimacy that you have as a mother with your children mm -hmm. can often replace the intimacy that you've had with a lover or your husband, I mean, obviously yeah. not sexually, but, uh, and so our needs are to be with those children intimately and then the husband we don't even think about his feelings <laughs> I mean we obviously right. think about them when he's like uh we don't have sex enough yeah and when you survey those new dads they will often tell you they're under touched they're under hugged oh oh God. and when you talk to <laughs> that's <laughs> the saddest I'm, thing excuse I'm... me I'm gonna go call my <laughs> motherfucker right now <laughs> We're going to pause for a moment while everyone calls their Everyone go check yeah. in. Text, oh, text, my your, text your guys. Oh. Yeah. And when you talk to new moms, we know how overwhelming it is, right? At the end of the day, they're like, 
I just want to not have a living being oh my God. climbing on my body. I just mm. want a little breathing room. No one else touching my boobs, please. Right. I still remember like trying to have sex after my second and then just like squirting milk all over him during and just being like, <laughs> is this what you wanted? <laughs> Is this it? This is it. This is, is what this, my body is, is right this now. Sexy to you? Yeah, and he was kind of like it. Kind of is a little bit sexy. <laughs> um, yeah, that's that's exactly something I'm that we don't to, think yeah. about in our misery for sure. Are you really texting Johnny right now? No, no, no. I'm reading. I'm trying to find someone left a really great comment about that. Oh, um, about the trying, intimacy. About the intimacy, and she felt um, that she. This is on our band of mothers um, private Facebook group. It, yeah. So she said. Um, our husband's not making us feel desired anymore due to our body changes. Oh, is that I, I'm I'm sensing That's a scary. theme here, or is that us projecting that on? I mean, I'm sure it's both, but I mean, is it real common for a guy just to be like, mm, "You're I'm done well, with you, you now"? What's amazing to me is the amount of men who don't even um, want to go below the shoulders when a baby's being born. I mean, there are, there are a ton of men out there. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. My husband's a fainter. Yeah. (laughs) We (laughs) were all concerned about him passing out. But I was was even thinking like, because it would, it would make them nervous because they're like, ew. I think there's a lot of men who, uh, and, and the only reason I even can say this is because I feel like my mother, did we tell you we call dads motherfuckers because they fuck mothers? That's Sorry, oh. that's why I keep saying okay. that. She's Get like, it? wow, healthy relationship. You keep calling your <laughs> husband a motherfucker. Well, um, we all have pet names, Shana. But he's had conversations with um, dudes that weren't necessarily his friends, but you know, been in a situation socially where he's heard guys talking about this. Like, the, oh, I would never go down there and see the baby coming out. It would ruin everything. It would ruin sex forever. Mm. You know, mm. these men exist. Like we go, you know, we do shows and mm-hmm. these women, you should see the text messages that they show us mm-hmm. during the whole show. Where, where they're the fuck, fuck are you? What This the baby's, baby's been crying. crying. <laughs> wow. This is weird. <laughs> We're in stereo. Jeez, buy me a Coke. <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah. And so that exists too. And so maybe this woman is really feeling that kind of a shittiness from her partner, which sucks. So yeah, let's trust that the woman that made this comment on the Facebook group that my husband doesn't support me in feeling attractive. Yeah. Let's trust that she's got a sense of something that's going on there that we don't know about. You know, I am happy to say I work with so many men all day, every day, and there is such an amazing, highly evolved group of men that are raising kids right now Mm -hmm, it really makes me warm and fuzzy for the planet as a whole so that I know the kind of guy that you're describing exists um because they're not the ones going to therapy unfortunately exactly so what I would say that I see far more often is it's not normally the men who are struggling with the woman's body after the birth of the baby it's usually us. Mm-hmm. It's usually the moms, right? Mm-hmm. Um, there's no kind of notion or image out there in society of a postpartum belly being sexy. Mm-hmm. You know, that's just not a thing that we ever hold up as a sign of beauty and motherhood. But so we should. We absolutely should. And even if we did, though, you just don't, it's not your same skin. You know, you just... Even if you are the most confident person, I think, again, it's like, this is, oh my gosh, I'm just like a different person all of a sudden, you know, oh, no matter. Yeah. Oh, you mean that struggle that we go through? Well, yeah, I just think sure. it's like, you just, I, I really, now that I reflect back on it, I mean, it really is like day, day one, you didn't have, you had a baby in your belly and you were a certain way. And then the next day you didn't. And everything about you has changed for the rest of your life. Mm-hmm. You know, your brain is different. Your heart is different. Your body is drastically different, even if mm-hmm. it's even if you bounce back, some people do. But if you don't, you just look at yourself and you're just you're just a different woman. Totally. Totally. I used to teach a workshop when my kids were tiny called How to Maintain Your Self Identity in the Throes of Motherhood. Mm-hmm. Because don't tell anybody that attended the workshop. I hadn't figured that shit out yet. <laughs> sure. <laughs> That's why I was teaching the class. I was hoping that somebody might show up with the answers. <laughs> What do you guys think? No, seriously. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah. yeah. But here's the other thing I want to loop back around to on this issue of, okay, so how and when do we become intimate again after the baby's born? Mm-hmm. We tend to downplay and minimize how important it is to the guys in our life to connect with us sexually. And again, 
they're not usually the ones who are advocating for it in a real soft, vulnerable way. They may not be using their words, Mm -hmm. right? Maybe, Maybe they are. Maybe they aren't. But I cannot tell you how many men have sat in my office and are on the verge of happy tears and talk about, but when we connect sexually, that's when I feel the closest to her. Mm. And I just want her back. Oh. It feels a little bit like I've lost oh, her to the shares. babies. <laughs> yeah. 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 And so I think sometimes we kind of do ourselves a disservice if we just kind of dismiss it as, oh, he just wants to get his jollies. I get it. Right. Sure. Like it really is his male way of reaching out to us. Yeah. But so you have a, a couple in your office. I'm giving you a... Sure. Hypothetical. So you have a couple in your office and the man is feeling this way Mm -hmm. and the woman is feeling like I can't have one more person need something from me physically. Mm -hmm. Um, What is the solution? Because it sounds to me like the only solution is for the woman to get out of her state of not wanting to be touched and try to find some intimacy with her husband, which I feel like isn't an easy thing to do. Mm. for a lot of women. I think the ultimate solution, so with couples, we're always looking for win-win scenarios. Mm. Not you're going to become my whipping boy and I'm going to be happy and you're going to be miserable or vice versa, right? Mm -hmm. It's got to be synergistic. It's got to be, I'm going to make you feel more fulfilled and you're going to make me feel more fulfilled and we're both going to feel supported and this is going to be this new chapter in our relationship. So... When I come home from a long day at the office and my husband has cooked dinner and it's waiting on the stove for me, I want to jump it his It is blow bones. job it time. Is. I t- hear you. Right? Or, yeah. Right? So when you figure out what your ultimate need is from your partner and they start meeting it, that is a natural kind of aphrodisiac in and of itself is when we feel more emotionally supported. Then we just... It's just an organic byproduct of that, of, hey, honey, what do you say? We put on a show for the kids, wink, wink. <laughs> well, we yeah. know all about that. <laughs> I mean, because I, you, well, yeah, because you. exactly it. But you, you just solved all of the but world's your, problems. But your superwoman <laughs> self has to ask for that. And that's the part I think that we struggle with. Like, mm-hmm. you have to say, I can't cook dinner tonight mm-hmm. or I can't cook dinner four nights of the week can you cook dinner well and because the more we that. the more we hope that that's just gonna happen and then it doesn't mm-hmm. is that resentment building again right it's like yeah. to this day I'm just like honey when will you ever book the ba- the babysitter like mm-hmm. it's always me who has to initiate right you know and the, the very few times that it ever has been his idea he's always like do you think that you could call a babysitter for Friday? You know, I'm like, just make a call, you know, yeah. <laughs> but those expectations, like if he just, I mean, I'm all about it. Like the, the take, taking care of you in some way, taking care of the house in some way, nothing makes me hornier than no. like a clean kitchen. Yeah. Well, Cause it's one less thing to worry about. It's part of your brain shuts off so you can allow other nice things to come in. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Or you just feel like nurtured. My husband will bring me coffee in bed on a Saturday oh. morning and I'm like, Get in here. Yeah. Now, did, did he, did he do that out of the goodness of his heart or, or is that something that you've, he's learned over time that really makes you happy? So one of the things that we're often guilty of as wives is we can be too exacting in how we want it to look, mm. right? So if we're feeling overwhelmed, we need more support, we need more help around the house or with the kids. Sometimes we have this very narrow idea in our head. It has to be that he cooks dinner on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. That's not fair. He needs to be able to bring his personality and his creativity, his imagination mm-hmm. to the picture. And he also gets a say in what mm. it looks like. Right? He does. <laughs> <laughs> Write this down, Tracy. Yes. So text. T- keep texting. <laughs> Not texting. She's like text texting notes to her motherfucker. I'm just gonna be laying naked tonight, and then just with like, I'm sorry, painted on my chest. <laughs> I'll hold you. I'll hold you all I'm night. Sorry. I'm sorry for all the hugs you deserved. <laughs> totally. um, okay, so that's so we don't. So we we have to get over our exact vision. Mm -hmm. And I think that's true in any relationship with, you know, whether your babies are 
grown up kids or you don't have kids yet. I mean, I think that yes, learning to manage expectations certainly has always been my number one struggle in our marriage. And again, managing my expectations Mm -hmm. um, of what I need or think and, and just lowering them. (laughs) Well, managing them or lowering them. Well, cause I was going to say, well, if, if he, if he just can't, if his, if calling the babysitter just isn't his thing, Mm -hmm. at some point, should you just know that that's your role? And then also maybe relinquish something else that's kind of your thing, but could also be his. That's an easy thing to delegate for lack of a better word, because mm. he's just never going to, I mean, it's eight years in Shay. He's never going to call it eight. <laughs> oh, you mean with the kids? Let it go, I, Shana. Yeah. You know? I know. No, it's true. And, and it is managing that, right? Like managing your expectations and what is a reasonable expectation based on personality and your, you know, yeah. just who the person is. And if you're going to mm-hmm. be super anal about these one things that you're very, you need right in your life, then you should just do it yourself. Oh God. So my office blows up around the holidays <laughs> and around anniversaries and birthdays. This is a thing. We have this idea, this lovely romanticized notion of how we want him to treat us on those special occasions. Mm-hmm. And very often we do a shit job of communicating it. Mm. Not all the time, but very often. Yeah. And I work with some freaking brilliant men, but not a damn one of them knows how to read minds. It's true. Sure. Right? And so then we get embroiled in this hurt and disappointment that, you know, my dream Christmas you didn't give me. But I never oh, told But also you. I never told you what it was. Right. Right. You know? There's a look that I that I can see like in Chris's eyes when the expectation <laughs> is just a little bit too beyond, you know? Yep. And it's just a like what you were just saying, right? Just like the backing <laughs> the up. Back up. The like, yeah. I'm totally fucked. Mm-hmm. I have no idea how to meet this. I'm going to fail. I don't even know why I'm fucked. I'm I know. Yeah. I love you. You know, yeah. it's just. And I can remember when the babies were so little and there was just, like you were saying, you're just this other person and you just have such trouble communicating Mm. things that you first of all there's more physical demand on on the mother so there's yeah. things that he just can't you know he's not going to get up in the middle of the night and and breastfeed sure um you know certainly not <laughs> but but he can change a diaper oh sir yes and yeah. I, and I was lucky that my husband was really good at changing diapers but there are these things there's things that we hear there's things that we feel physically that they're just never going to feel there's things that we think about doing in the house that they're just never gonna think about doing Mm -hmm. and so it's so easy for that to to be angry about it yeah and so for all the moms and dads out there who are like let's say within their first seven years of being parents if you have not yet clearly worked out with your partner what your roles are going to be and what their roles are going to be lock that shit down Mm. because what it does is it starts erasing opportunities for misunderstandings and conflict so I told you guys I'm like 19 years into marriage now we're like one of those old graying couples (laughs) I just have a really good hairdresser really I mean your hair I have no idea how gorgeous this woman is (laughs) I mean like crushing so hard your hair and you beautiful yes. thank you but years ago we just got it rote and routine because we both have busy careers and that's what we need so Tuesday Thursday he leaves his job early he's got the kids at sports he's super invested in what they're up to and I'm working late those nights and then Monday Wednesday Friday the kids need to go to the doctor or the orthodontist I'm on it like it's very mm. clearly delineated And that's something that supports a lot of couples. Okay, I'm lawn maintenance, you're house cleaning, Mm -hmm. or however you want to break it down, just so that we're not every freaking week having the conflict of whose effing job was it to take out the trash? It's so difficult because you say that and it sounds so ideal. And yet, and it's it's almost me devaluing our career because like, Mm. I feel like because I have flexibility, because we work from home, even though we travel a ton and we have all these other things, I still take on, this is my own doing, I take on the majority of the responsibilities, household responsibilities and children responsibilities because I know that he has a eight to six job. Yeah. And I'm mad, you know, sometimes I'm mad about it. <laughs> yeah. No, right. no, I'm the same way. Right. Sometimes we resent them about it. Yeah. And it's like, I'd, 
I, you know what? I'd love to not have to stop my day at 3.30 and go grocery mm-hmm. shopping you know, and, and start dinner yeah. and pick everybody up and take them to ballet. And, but there's, mm-hmm. rightfully so, he's actually going to the office from 8 to 6, which is a difficult or seven or nine to, you know, whatever it is, but it's a difficult position too. So yeah, there's just going to be an unequal amount of household responsibilities when you, when you have different jobs like that. Well, does it though? I mean, that's what you're saying. If yeah. you, if you don't, if you figure it out, it doesn't have to be unequal. Right. And, the, and this is what we we're saying, like about the yoga class, like this morning, I was like, Hey, tomorrow, can you take Bo to school? Cause I'm taking Georgia to swimming. And he was like, sure. Like he has no problem when I ask. <laughs> no, I mean, he would never be like, well, I'm paying the bills, you know, yeah. like, right. but what is it in me mm-hmm. that is afraid to ask that question? Because mm-hmm. he would never. Well, I think there are two things going on here. So the running joke in my marriage is we need to get us a wife because this is a three person job and there's only two of us. Right. So like there's just always going to be stuff that's Mm -hmm. undone and it's always going to feel like a lot. And oftentimes it's like our own insecurities around um, our worth our mm-hmm. net worth, um, our lovability that prompts us to just overpack our own plates and not always ask for as much help, right? So sometimes when we, uh, we very often in this generation step down in our careers and we put flexibility first and foremost um, among this generation of college educated moms. Mm-hmm. And that often comes at a loss of income right? If Mm -hmm. you're not working Mm -hmm. 40 hours a week, you're generally going to earn less than if you were. And so sometimes we have insecurities about that. Oh shit. Well, I'm not contributing as much financially. And I really liked it when I was a financially independent woman. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes we just feel like, um, you know, we feel a little insecure if we're not doing it all ourselves. We're usually much better at giving to others than we are at like, receiving support for ourselves I find that a lot there's you know we always have a conversation about I I have a lot of girlfriends who feel very guilty about having like someone help clean the house and someone help to come in okay attention women of America (laughs) get over that shit (laughs) yeah well because it's like well and I I absolutely struggle with it myself here I am, an able-bodied healthy woman (laughs) I should just be doing this myself and I beat Mm -hmm. myself up every time Mm mm-hmm and it's like a failure on my part. But this is a weird segue, but we've been re-watching Downton Abbey. <laughs> but Love in, Downton But Abbey. over time, everyone's had help in their families up until recently, I would mm-hmm. say. In the last maybe 100 years at the most, probably 50 or 60 is more yeah. realistic. Everyone had a night nurse or a maid or a nanny. And even in Downton Abbey downstairs, they had people serving them dinner. Like mm-hmm. in, this is the first time where we're really expected to do every single thing, cut the line, wash the floors, take care of the kids, like all of it right. without any help. And it does, you do need a wife or a yeah. village. Yeah. I mean, are any of us surprised that multi-generational households are making a strong comeback? Like yeah. I would kind of kill to have a mother-in-law living downstairs that could watch the kids for two hours while I go grab a cocktail with my husband. Does yeah. it have to be my mother-in-law? <laughs> <laughs> no, we can talk about her later offline, Shana. <laughs> um, uh, I wanted to bring this up because I thought this was an interesting comment. Um, someone wrote, our biggest issue is that my husband felt like he was entitled to still prioritize his me time over the family. So we had some huge blow up fights about his lack of housework and not taking his turn helping with the baby because he was in the middle of a computer game and didn't want to let the guys he was playing with down. Oh, mm-hmm. So this is most likely a woman who's not feeling like she and her family are the most important thing in her partner's life, right? Mm -hmm. So it's never about the topic that we're arguing about or that we're resentful about. It's not actually about the video game. It's about the feelings that his behaviors are creating. We could guess maybe she's feeling unsupported. Right. Yeah. So how how do you dig yourself out of that? Well, we take a deep breath and we remind ourselves that it's actually okay to need somebody and it's actually okay to be vulnerable and to admit, I can't do this shit by myself. Right. And to hold your head high and ask for more support. 
The other thing that happens in a lot of relationships, especially when you've got tiny kids at home, is one of the roles women tend to fall into is we kind of unintentionally become the relationship manager. We were raised as girls to pay attention to relationships. We have our eye on the kids. How are they doing? Are they okay? Are they struggling? We have our eye on the relationship. How are we doing? Are we stuck? What's going on here? And one of the things that, you know, it's a thing that happens in my office countless times a week is a woman kind of stands in her power and says, we're not okay. We're stuck. We need to go get help because I want this family to not only survive, but I want it to thrive. And the way you're treating me right now, that's not working. Mm -hmm. What, What percentage would you feel of the dads are into the idea of going when they first come to see you? Um, So when you reach out for for professional support, it should always be going after a win-win scenario. And so I would say 80% of the phone calls that I get from hetero couples are from the woman. And usually by the end of the first session, the, the man is feeling like, fuck yeah, this isn't working for me either. And this person just gave me some language that yes. maybe I didn't even have. He can be heard. To be heard and mm-hmm. start to crystallize what's not working for me either. And a win-win scenario I can totally get on board with. I can like we that. talk about um, the video game uh, <laughs> Sunday Sunday football <laughs> um, dynamic? Dynamic. I mean, uh-huh. you know, we that's a huge problem. You, sitting while the children are going crazy. It's a Sunday. He is home from work and there's hours and hours of football to watch. There's video games that are being played. Like what help, help us with that. Yeah. (laughs) Take up knitting. (laughs) So in my marriage, it was never Sunday football. It was a mountain biking season. Oh, wow. And it has been, you know, um, sad but true, yelled in my house on more than one occasion. When is it goddamn fucking Angela season? It's Aww. always mountain biking season, Aww. right? Right. So it doesn't really matter what the thing is. What's really helpful for our partners is when they can identify what helps me keep my head above water. What is my joy, my bliss that I'm not going to give up? If it's Sunday football and he can realize that, maybe he actually needs to ask that the kids are not there. Maybe he's down at the sports bar where he can actually focus on the game and not have to parent at the same time. And he can advocate for that the same way that we can say, I really need this girl's weekend. It's for my sanity. Mm. Right. Um, What becomes kind of problematic is when our partners don't have clarity and around what they need. And so what men will sometimes do is they'll just take what they need Mm -hmm. instead of asking for what they need. Mm. Like I had a really hard week. I really just need to totally check out and lose myself in the video game, but I'm not actually verbalizing that to my partner. You're just walking downstairs and ignoring everything that's (laughs) going on. (laughs) Exactly. I'm just checking out. And now she's wondering why are the children bouncing on the sofa next to you? And you Mm. haven't even noticed. Mm. Right. If he had just been able to say that morning, I am so fried. I need to just, you know, check out for the day. She'd be probably be like, OK, fair enough. Let's let's work out a plan. Oh, this has oh, been so amazing. Angela. Angela. <laughs> so you're coming you. back Good. next I'm week. Glad. I know we <laughs> could chat. We could chat with you all Anytime. all day. Um, you've been extremely helpful um, in helping us look at this in a whole different way. Yes. Good. We really appreciate it. So speaking of dads. So speaking of dads, we really do try not to dad bash or kid bash at our show. Um, We call, we call them motherfuckers, but that's about as, as jokey as we get. Yeah. We appreciate it's not easy being a dad at all. It's not, but it is so much better than being a mom. For sure. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, we have a song that um, I sing at all the shows, um, and it's it's a it's a definitely a favorite. It's um because it it speaks to a lot of the truths about that difference that we were talking about with Angela. So we thought you guys might enjoy it, given the subject today. 
This is a recording from one of our Mother's Day Eve shows here in Denver at the Paramount Theater. Um, it's called, I Don't Want to Die, But When I Do, I Want to Come Back as a Dad. I don't want to die, but when I do, I want to come back as a dad. I want to do all the fun stuff without packing a diaper bag. Dads can't hear the babies cry from a sound sleep in the middle of the night. I don't want to die, but when I do, I want to come back as a dad. I don't want to be the only one who reads about milestones, rashes, and sits. And I like to call it babysitting when I'm home alone with the kids. They're all doing it right now, so you could come to this show. <laughs> How would a weekly softball game and not to remember the sitter's name? <laughs> I don't want to dab when I do. I want to come back as a dab. I want to boner the very next day after my kid is born. <laughs> <laughs> and I want everyone to kiss my ass just for wearing a baby Bjorn. Oh my God, you're so cute with that baby. Are you, are you alone? Do you need help? <laughs> How do I want to pump at work or stain another dark colored shirt with my booby squirt? How do I want to die, but when I do, I want to come back as a dad. I want a hot mom lady to make me feel like a daddy man. And I'm gonna watch her rock it out and take the house command. But then I'm gonna forget all the food she's packed and give the kids another sugar snack. <laughs> Just before their nap. <laughs> I don't want a dad, but when I do, I want to come back as a dad. It's never stretched. And I want another beer, and another beer, and another beer. I want a fantasy football draft during cries that I never hear. And I want to shower in pride. Or not to pee every time I sneeze. Sad cake. Sad cake. <laughs> I don't want to die, but when I do, I want to come back as a dad. I want to come back as a dad. I want to come back as a dad. All right, well, we are back on tour officially. You're done, you're done hearing us talk about going on tour. We are now <laughs> back on tour. We went to Fort Lauderdale. Our skin felt oh, amazing. We were so happy. Um, we stayed in the worst hotel ever. We actually had to move rooms, and I told Shay it was so gross. I mean, there was, I hate, there was pubes on the... <laughs> On the counter. And in the it bathroom. wasn't our pubes. It was not ours. And there was like, you could just tell nothing had been wiped down. It was almost crusty and gross. And I. It was as if somebody like had just like jizzed all over oh the room. God. And then like, they were like, next. It was disgusting. And I think <laughs> in all these years of touring, I think this is the first time I've ever looked at Shana and said, we can't sleep here. And it was like 1230 in the morning. We were so When we tired. got there or at night. At yeah. Night, you know. Four hour flight. Hadn't really had dinner. And, and we changed just, rooms. We had to switch rooms. But regardless, it was such a fun show. And I think, honestly, besides the show and meeting all the moms, the real highlight was that Hamilton was right next to us. 
yes. I know. How fun was that? It was so fun. And you knew the stage manager. And we thought about just putting on a movie for our audience and going to, to see Hamilton. We're just like, those girls will be fine. We're just going to sneak over backstage. Uh, but no, we did a show and it was lovely. So, so thank now, you, Broward Center for yes, Performing thank Arts. thank you, Broward. That was a real treat. Gosh, it's gorgeous there that you guys have a real great um, performing arts center. It's really nice for your community. Mm-hmm. Uh, so this week we go to Fort Collins and... We have no idea if we're sold out or not, but it's real close. Well, apparently there's like 20 tickets, but they're all singles. Um, so go so. by yourself. It'll be great. <laughs> I mean, just bring yourself like a flask. <laughs> just sit there. Whatever. It's mom. So make friends. Yeah, everyone will um, make friends. So that's happening. And then after that, we go to Durango, right? Yes. We fly an hour in our own state, <laughs> in our own state to Durango uh, on February 6th. Yep. And then on the 9th, we go to Salem, Oregon. Yes, which is not that far from Eugene, Oregon. So if you are a Marley's Monsters fan <laughs> and you... Uh, wipe-ups. And you wipe-ups. and you love wipe-ups and now you listen to our podcast, they are located in Eugene. We are asking you, Marley's Monsters, come see the show. Yeah. Um, and then after that, on the 23rd of February, we go to Atlanta, Georgia. February 23rd. And um, and then March 14th, we go to Indianapolis. We go to a buttload more cities. So check yeah. out the pump and dump show.com slash tour um, for all of the cities and get your tickets. Everything's on sale now except Mother's Day, Mother's Day Eve, which um, we'll be announcing soon. very, very soon. So Florida, we already miss you. It was nice to be in 80 degrees <laughs> <It was nice laughs> for like 24 hours. <laughs> we'll see you at the next show.